All right, I'm going to start since it's uh, five, almost five past. Thanks for being here, small group. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, my voice is very strained. I've been fighting a flu, so hopefully I'll get through the whole thing. Um, like I said, thanks for being here. My name is Teresa Regley. Uh, I'm an analyst with a firm called Real Story Group. Does anyone know us already? All right. <laughs> One, and that's my colleague Scott back there, so it's good. One person knows us. OK, awesome. Uh, so to give a little background on um, myself, um, I've worked in, in sort of internet technology IT for about 20 years. Um, and my particular focus for the last eight years has been the digital and media asset management market. So I used to implement uh, web content management systems and digital asset management systems and sort of moved into the media side um, more precisely about five years ago. Uh, and I've worked with a lot of large media companies, um, ESPN, IMG, the ones that do all the celebrity management, et cetera. Uh, a couple movie studios, a couple networks. Turner Broadcasting's been uh, a customer of ours as well. And we advise really on uh, two main things. Uh, one is around product selection. So we uh, are a completely vendor uh, agnostic firm. Um, we don't do any work with vendors or partnership with vendors. We, we help companies understand what they should buy to solve their problems uh, and give them completely objective advice. And then we also uh, now have a uh, effectiveness measurement practice where we help companies benchmark how good they are at what they're trying to do. Um, so I'm going to show you some different models today uh, as far as what we've seen uh, make or break media asset management implementations, um, sort of what we see as uh, the measures that you should use in different sorts of implementations. And then I'm actually going to give you all a model uh, that you can look at and you can assess yourselves. Uh, and use, and uh, we'll, we'll just hopefully have a little conversation about it, and uh, that'll hopefully make it a little bit more of a useful session for you rather than just listening to me lose my voice. Okay? All right. Uh, so as I mentioned, the main thing that we do at Real Story Group uh, is we evaluate products. Uh, so this is just sort of an overview of uh, the, the products we evaluate, and this is really hard to see, so my, my colleague Scott's going to give you a printout <laughs> so you can actually see it. Uh, and this is a, a subway map. We cover eight different markets, so media management is, is actually just one market that we, that we cover. Uh, and we had a vision one night while we were um, in London, we being some members of the team at Real Story Group. Uh, we were in London, we'd probably had a few gin and tonics, and we were sitting in the uh, tube station, and we looked at this and said, wow, that would be really cool if we put all the vendors that we evaluate on this, on this tube map. Uh, so we took this tube map, and uh, we, we specifically did a different line for each of the markets we cover. So you're probably not involved with a lot of the um, technologies that are outlined on this particular map. Um, the one that you should care about uh, is the one that starts in the top right-hand side, which is digital and media asset management. Uh, I believe the one on the top there is uh, Selim, and it loops its way around. Um, vendors that I'm sure you all know, like uh, Avid and Dillette and Squarebox and Viz and all these um, big media management tools. Uh, that are out there. We also uh, focus very heavily on the sort of brand management market and the image management market. So there's tools out there that, are, of course, are focused on managing media uh, and, and, and do the video streaming. They're the ones that are here. Um, but there's also a lot of tools that do both image management as well as video management, uh, as well as uh, sort of creative operations management for people that are creating uh, sort of marketing collateral with uh, Creative Suite and Adobe products that aren't Premiere. So, uh, so we test those products, we evaluate those products, we talk to customers and sort of find out how to go for you. You know, was it any good? Um, did it actually work the way that the salesperson said it was going to work, or did they tell you lies and then you get in a situation where it wasn't a very good implementation? Uh, so that's what our research is focused on. And uh, if you have a question about any of the vendors on that map, uh, you should definitely go to our website because we're always blogging about them. And, uh, and of course, our research covers them in a whole bunch of depth. Any, I'll just pause there. Any questions on the map? Does it make sense? It's not what this session is about, but I just thought we'd give it to you so you had it as a reference. OK. So here's the agenda for this session. Um, first, I'm going to talk about metrics uh, and the importance of metrics today in what we do uh, as, as technology implementers, as Video producers, whatever your particular uh, roles are, are most of you just in? Are you are you video producers? What what's some of your roles here? Just so I understand exactly what they are. What your production distribution? Same. Okay, video on demand. Okay, great. Other same sort of stuff. Okay, perfect. 
So uh, that's good. So I'm going to talk specifically about why metrics are important today. Uh, I think probably all of you have someone that you have to report to about the success or the effectiveness of what you're doing um, in one way or another. And we realized many years after um, helping people select tools, they would sometimes come back to us and say, are we good or are we bad compared to everybody else that you've worked with or everybody else that you've selected a tool for? Uh, and so we sort of said, huh, we should start tracking this data. So a couple years ago, we actually started to track metrics on how successful certain people were um, in what they did. So I'm going to talk about those metrics. I'm going to take multiple water breaks because of my throat, so apologies. Um, then I'm going to talk about, well, what should you be measuring, right? As people who are in the business of video and in the business of video streaming, you might say, oh, what exactly, you know, two years from now, we should be able to look back at where we were two years ago and compare it to today and say, oh, we got markedly better in this way or another way. So we'll talk about what the specific measurements should be. And this is, again, sort of culled from our research over the years where people have said, oh, this is where we stalled and this is what we had to focus on to actually be effective. And then I'll talk about what hinders people's effectiveness. And then we're going to hand out some papers so you can do your own self-assessment uh, on the fly if you'd like, or you can take it back to your office if you feel like you can't you know, do it right away. Uh, and then I'm going to show you some industry benchmarks. Uh, so if anybody wants to uh, be daring and, and do a self-assessment and bring it up, we can put it in the app and I can compare it to uh, the industry standard if, if you want to put yourself in that, in that position. You're welcome to do it. So it's meant to be, uh, as I mentioned, fun, interactive, and a discussion. OK, so metrics. Let's just talk about metrics in general. Um, metrics are everywhere these days. Right? This is a, a screenshot that I took coming out of the toilet in Singapore airport, right? where they actually asked me to rate my experience in the toilet, which I thought was really kind of odd and bizarre. Um, but they even showed me a picture of the woman who cleaned the toilet. <laughs> and uh, they told me that the screen is regularly sanitized. Okay. So I could, I could, as I was leaving the toilet, I could say I had a fine experience in the toilet, or I had it was terrible, it was clean, you know, clean, whatever. And I thought to myself, wow, you know, is this woman potentially getting measured based on how people are rating this experience, right? Is she getting compensated based on how people are rating their experience? Does she get a bonus if everybody says I had an excellent experience in the toilet today, right? So the the idea of metrics and analytics has just permeated our world. Um, and I think specifically with the technologies that we're buying and implementing, they're very expensive, right? They're very expensive tools. I'm sure many of you have either bought or created multi-million dollar video tools, either for production or streaming or distribution, whatever it is. Uh, and you might be asked, well, was this worth the money? <laughs> you know, are we actually doing it well? Uh, and so it, it just goes all the way from from measuring your experience in the loo to, to multi-million dollar ROI. Did I, did I get that ROI? Um, interestingly, there's also situations where it's getting presented back to the customers. So this is a, a screen that I took a picture of in Heathrow Airport, which is an airport that I fly through a lot. And they actually uh, show on the screens how well they're doing on a regular basis. So this is something I'm also seeing a lot in the corporate world, where for instance, you know, how is how's the video streaming performance, right? Are you monitoring that on a regular basis? Do you actually know uh, whether your media asset management system is reducing your production time? You know, is it is it actually allowing you via a direct integration to be more efficient, right? And part of the issue that we have is that a lot of times before you buy a technology, you don't necessarily establish a benchmark. Okay? So this screen in the middle of Heathrow Airport. It's asking a few questions. Uh, is the security waiting time five minutes or more? You know, you see a lot of reds there, right? So in, in Terminal 4, it's much better than it is in Terminal 3, Terminal 1, and Terminal 5, right? Versus some lines you're waiting for more than 10 minutes. Um, and then it's asking, you know, are all the lifts, escalators, and passenger conveyors running efficiently, right? So they, of course, decided to set forth these particular metrics that they were going to measure. So that's my first challenge to you, right? Do you actually know what you're measuring? No. Do you know what you're looking at and figuring out, are we doing this well or are we not doing it well? Do any of you actually have metrics that you're using already to measure your effectiveness? Two, three, OK, half of the room. OK. <coughs> Pardon me. I really hope I don't have a coughing fit. <clears throat> so that's challenge number one. What are your metrics? What should they be? And then make sure that you have overall buy-in uh, as to what they are. 
You know, you could look at a typical um, media asset management system or digital asset management system. I tend to use those terms pretty interchangeably. It's just that a MAM is focused specifically on video, right? And you can say, okay, these systems do very straightforward things, right? They're ingesting, they're allowing you to create, do management, organization, and production tasks, and then distribute, broadcast, and convert in some way, potentially monetize. So for each of these items, I would say, even if you have metrics already, do you know what your specific metrics are in each of these areas? Right? We want to be able to ingest at a rate of x. You know, we want to be able to create different formats um, with this amount of speed and this amount of efficiency. Um, we want to be able to find media assets precisely within a video that might be an hour long program. You might want to be able to search via metadata that's embedded in a particular segment. Right? So these are general terms, but what are the specific things you want to be able to measure and accomplish within each of these sort of supersets of, of categories? The beautiful thing is that if you do establish this before you buy a technology, uh, you will actually be able to better justify more investment later. Um, you'll be able to actually say, I, I had good return because before we had this technology, it took us two weeks to do this. Uh, now it takes us a week. So challenge number one. Make sure that you go through these items and understand what's important for you, what's important for you uh, to measure now and benchmark uh, and understand later if you've improved. So as we've done our research and our surveys, we've asked, OK, you know, when you're trying to figure out if you're effective, what, what's causing you to not be effective or what's been the barriers to effectiveness? When do uh, media asset management efforts tend to stall? And these are the things that we found um, over the years as we, as we uh, did this research with various, various media companies. Um, a lot of people just said, well, we never had a business case that justified the implementation to begin with. So we never actually had it documented why we bought this thing <laughs> or why we bought these tools or why we implemented these tools. We just felt like, OK, you know, we're, we're in the business of streaming media. Or we're in the business of deploying media. So we, we have to buy a, a, a tool to do it. Even if you already have a tool, I would say go back and, and, and document why you bought it. And again, figure out what the benchmarks are that you want to measure yourself against. A lot of people also they buy the wrong product or tool because they haven't necessarily written um, that business case. And then they can't measure whether or not it's actually given them the return that they, that they expected to begin with because they didn't know why they were buying it. it was, it's kind of shocking. People have spent millions of dollars and yet didn't do this to, uh, to start with. Uh, there's a lot of issues with not allocating enough budget. Um, there's a lot of issues with business process not being uh, addressed or refined. This is especially true, I think, in media production uh, studios and media production scenarios, where there tends to be a lot of, up. Oh, Joe's back from the shoot in Brazil. I'm going to dump these tapes on Sally's desk. And oh, they're not labeled. They have no metadata. They're just there. Uh, and then somebody's putting it into a production system. And there's an editor that works on it sort of in his own little vacuum without actually doing any tagging or enrichment of it necessarily. It's just a production process. And then it might end up in a media asset management system or a distribution tool without a lot of you know, metadata around it. And then no one can find it later unless they actually go to the public streaming site, right? So I see some nods as you're living this every day. Is <laughs> that hopefully what it meant? But um, so. That's a situation where uh, it's also difficult to measure effectiveness because if you don't think about, OK, we need to refine our process before we implement a tool, uh, then you're not really able to, to measure whether it, uh, it had return either. Um, poor metadata hindering findability was a huge uh, hindrance to effectiveness that a lot of people uh, talked about. So they might have spent a million or a million five on a media asset management tool, but they didn't spend uh, the time and the effort to actually have a really solid metadata strategy, uh, not only what the metadata should be, but how it should be used in a media file uh, to actually increase the findability and the ease of people in an organization who is who's not a media producer uh, to find what they're looking for. Uh, lack of training, lack of education, lack of top uh, management commitment, and lack of stakeholder participation. These are all the things that really contribute to the problems, right? So when people me measure their success and then they list, well, this is what's causing the problems, this is what came out um, as part of our research process. So let me give you a few examples of um, what you know, mattered to people. It's a little tough to see there in the projection. This is, um, this is media management in Viz1. Anyone here use Viz1? 
No one uses Viz1. OK, so Viz1 is a uh, media asset management tool. And the reason I bring this up is because uh, what a lot of people uh, cite as an issue when they, when they use our, um, our effectiveness model is they say, well, we tagged a lot of media, right? And we have this media archive. And we can type in a word, or we can type in a title or a file name, and we can find the file. But I'm actually looking for this 30-second segment that I need to take out and that I need to use in something else, or uh, I need to go back to the mezzanine file, or I need to go back to the, the raw files, whatever it might be. Um, and they can't find that particular segment, right? Um, so one of the things that's a huge differentiator in terms of media management effectiveness is being able to put metadata in certain layers of a media file. Are people doing that here? Or are you just tagging the file as a whole? Anyone? Volunteer? Neither. Neither? You're tagging the whole file. <laughs> OK, that's what most companies are doing. Um, and they're finding this is, a, this is a big hindrance to reuse. right? And reuse is a big factor in, in effectiveness and being able to reuse content being able to stream a portion of something, being able to create uh, a, a highlight reel, for example, um, being able to create a trailer. You want to be able to find segments within a larger uh, video segment. So I use this as an example because it actually um, allows you to go to a particular, so along the bottom there, we've got the, the, the time codes. It actually allows you to pick a specific time code and say, I'm going to put metadata right here at this particular point in the video so that then I can go in, or if somebody later needs to find this particular moment or this particular segment, they can do it uh, very specifically. So layered uh, media tagging. Yeah. 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 Correct. 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 Yep. Yep. Avid does it too. Avid Interplay. Uh, Ma'am, does it? In the new version? <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying. Yep. Uh huh. The whole file. Does this as well? Yeah. Yeah. There's various tools that do it, and some that don't. Um, I bring it up specifically because it really, as people took, as people did their own self-assessment, they said, "Wow, this would this would cut down so much of our of our production time and so much of our reuse, and would enhance reuse." So, so this was a big uh, a big factor. A movie that's very popular, a movie that's very long, yeah, it could be very useful. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I think there's always, um, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a metadata uh, guru by any means, but I think people who design metadata models, uh, th they're the first people, if they're good at what they do, to say there's a limit that you should, you know, there's a line you should draw. So, I, uh, you know, establishing use cases, understanding what are you really trying to accomplish, uh, and that's where you have to drive the metadata from. You don't want to just do metadata for metadata's sake, uh, but in the case of, if you do have very high levels of segment reuse, uh, figure out what the scenarios are. You know, I always say let the use cases drive it. Don't just tag for tagging's sake. Okay. Uh, another thing that came up a lot um, in our research was the idea of, uh, of scalability. So um, when it came to especially streaming scenarios, when it came to uh, collaboration scenarios at a global level, so where you got somebody in New York and somebody in LA and they're working on a uh, a production together, maybe they're using, uh, you know, one of the uh, Adobe or the Avid Anywhere, Any Place tools. I forget what they're called, but one of the tools where you can do, you know, cloud-based production. Uh, scale was a big factor, and speed was a big factor. So, you know, making sure that you have uh, good infrastructure, making sure that you're working. Um, you know, generally today it's all about working um, with with really powerful cloud providers, <coughs> so that you can have a um, a good uh, response rate and that you can really uh, scale to the degree that you need to scale. That again lends into speed. Um, and then also the number of people that might be using your media asset management system or your production tools. So uh, a lot of people in our research have said, well, uh, as soon as I have 10 or more simultaneous users on the system, you know, actors in the, in the sort of traditional um, code speak, as soon as they had a certain number, uh, the system would slow down, it would croak. 
it would have problems. So you'll want to make sure from a scale perspective as well. Uh, unfortunately, in this particular industry of video, uh, there's, there's huge burden on servers. There's uh, a lot of work you have to do to make sure that uh, in terms of scale from a geographic perspective as well as scale from a user perspective, um, that you're, you're continuing to uh, pay attention to that. Another thing that came up was uh, format support for preview. So in a lot of the systems that manage video, uh, there's so many uh, different file formats now. Uh, many of the systems today that are media management tools, they, they ingest a lot of the formats, but they can't necessarily thumbnail the format. You can't necessarily stream uh, a preview version. So if you, if you search within these systems, um, you might not get, so those are all very friendly looking thumbnails because those are all MP4s and JPEGs. But uh, if you have unusual formats of some kind, if you're doing 3D, if you're doing Ultra HD, um, I'm sure many of you are, um, some of the systems do not yet support uh, sort of the more unique, for example, 3D uh, formats that are out there. So um, a lot of the effectiveness and, and the return that you're going to get from these tools is how widely and how broadly they can support the file formats that you specifically have. Uh, measuring effectiveness is a little bit different depending on your use case, right? Uh, so I'm going to be handing, or Scott's actually going to be handing you a, uh, uh, an effectiveness model or a way that you can assess yourself that's very generalized. But depending where you fit in with, with media and what you're doing exactly, uh, you're going to be measuring your effectiveness potentially a little bit differently, right? Uh, so if you're in radio broadcasting or if you're in television news versus if you're broadcasting like a town hall meeting because uh, you're an internal um, comms person, uh, you're going to have a different a different benchmark for yourself, right? You're going to have different standards that you're going to want to measure yourself by. Uh, if you are doing video advertising, again, that's going to be a different benchmark. There's going to be different ways that you're going to want to uh, measure yourself by. So I've put you know, a few uh, categories whereby, depending on what kind of system you're, you're using or what you're doing in your world, uh, you might be doing internal enterprise video uh, management and streaming. You might be doing media asset management where uh, you've got broadcast you know, going out, which is probably the lion's share of you, given uh, this, this conference historically. Um, or maybe you are the person that's sort of putting the video on the, uh, on the platform that's doing the streaming. Uh, so you'll want to think about, OK, what are my, again, what are my benchmarks? Um, what exactly am I measuring in each of these areas? Uh, and think about that before so you can measure the uh, effectiveness a little later. All right, so let's talk about what the actual criteria are in our generalized self-assessment. So um, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, what I call a maturity model. Has anyone here ever used a maturity model of any kind? Uh, no, no, not at all. OK. So we call it an effectiveness model, but there's a lot of generic maturity models. If you're on your, uh, any of your devices, you could do a search for maturity model, and you get all kinds of maturity models. I'm going to walk you through one that's specifically for digital and media asset management. So what a maturity model is and what it does uh, is it helps you determine, OK, where am I today in terms of how good I am at what I'm doing? Uh, and then where do I want to be, right? The to be state. So it allows you to define the as is state and then the to be state. And it really helps you set a benchmark to say, OK, I understand where we are today. But I also can look and say, this is what our potential is. Like this is where this, it defines an ideal state, essentially. And uh, it allows you to analyze, OK, how am I going to get from point A to point B to point Z, right? Uh, there's one specifically for digital and media asset management that's at um, dammaturitymodel.org, and I'm going to show you that in a second. Uh, and it allows you to measure yourself in four different dimensions. So it's not just about the technology, <laughs> right? Being effective in what you're doing, um, whether you're in charge of video production, video shoots, video streaming, video distribution, whatever it is, uh, it's not just about the technology, right? So we put it into four different dimensions. Uh, people. So what are the people doing? Are they doing the right thing? Do we have people in the right roles? Do they have the right responsibilities assigned to them? Do they have the right interrelationships that's going to allow you to be effective? Uh, second, information. That is, do you have the material and the related descriptors, like the metadata, um, that enables you to use your video assets in an effective way? And finally, systems. These are the related components that work together uh, to facilitate the life cycle of assets, right? So that's the technology piece. Is our technology actually facilitating what we need to do? 
And then finally, the process. So it's actually allowing you to assess your process and say, do we have a repeatable set of procedures that everybody understands um, and that allows us to go through each stage efficiently? Okay. And then within each of those dimensions, you can rate yourself among in these different uh, areas. So you've got technical expertise, business expertise, alignment, et cetera. And I'm going to um, show you really quickly, actually, on the website. Um, some of you probably actually went to the site while we were um, while I was chatting away. Uh, and this is, this is what it allows you to, uh, to say, OK, do I have people who actually are owning these assets? Do I have, you know, we say DAM managers, but it can be media asset management man managers. Do I have people who are managing the rights? Um, do I have the people who are able to do the reporting and the analytics properly? Um, do I have channel managers who know which channels these things are going to go to and how? Uh, do I have librarians who are actually doing the proper metadata tagging? Do I have archivists if I need them? Right? Do I have asset creators? Do I have sales and marketing managers if I need them? So it allows you to, to sort of go through these details <coughs> in terms of information. You know, are we doing ingestion effectively? How, is, how are we doing it? Um, are we doing proper versioning of our assets? So if we need to do rollback, if we need to do these different tasks, uh, do we have proper media transcoding and transformation and processing? Uh, are we doing effective delivery? So it's got all these criteria in there that you can, uh, that you can go through. And at this point, I'm going to ask uh, Scott to give out uh, the actual paper version so that you can look at it in detail. And he's got a few um, copies of it. <laughs> That'll help you. And what would be great is if you do have a pen, you can start rating yourself, right? And for each of these dimensions, there's four, five different levels, right? And the five different levels, you can say, well, we absolutely suck, <laughs> right? That's level one. We're very ad hoc, right? We have exposure to some of these applications, um, but we really don't necessarily understand you know, how to use them particularly effectively. You could say, well, we're more like we're incipient. We have a slight understanding of, of what these things do. Uh, often sort of starts in the form of a generalized content management system. It's not necessarily uh, specific to you know, what you need to do as media professionals. Um, or maybe in some dimensions, you're, you're more formative, where you say, you know what, we already have the right technology in place, or we have the right people in place, um, but they're not necessarily in sync. They're not necessarily working together. They're not necessarily. Uh, integrated if it's two different technologies. <coughs> Operational means, you know what, we are really good at this. We have the right tool in place, or we have the right person in place. They know what they're doing, and they're doing it particularly well. And then there's optimal. So everything on the far right of the chart that you're looking at, <coughs> pardon my coughing, is meant to describe an ideal state. So that ideal state is where you would say, OK, that's where, I'm, you know, that's where I'm headed. And this is a generalized, and it refers to assets and digital assets. But that's you know, your media assets. It's your video assets. We tried to generalize it so it wasn't just for video people. And uh, we started to use it a lot <laughs> in, uh, in client situations where um, when we had subscribers to our research who would call us up and say, hey, you know, are we any good at this? Um, and we would plot, so the red would be where they are now. And then the green was, we would often say, well, where do you want to be in six months? Where do you want to be in a year? You know, where do you want to be in two years? Right? And there was a certain level of sobering discussion that would always happen, because we'd say, OK, you know, you're, you're really ad hoc in one area, but you're quite operational in another area. But you've got to move this one dimension all the way up. You know, you've got to have better metadata before you can do these five other things. Right? So it's also helping you identify what the potential dependencies are, uh, what you might need to do before you can do something else. Um, and it's, it's also meant to help IT and, uh, and, and your you know, content teams align, for example, if perhaps they're not you know, connected. So it got to be really messy to do it on paper. <laughs> um, but you all have a copy of it. And uh, we actually decided to put it all in an application. Right? And, and start to gather the data over time from different industries. So I was going to ask if anybody actually wanted to be the guinea pig. Uh, I was going to open the app, and I was going to show you 
um, what we've done in terms of ratings of, of other media companies. Is it fair to say that most of you are media, working in media or media companies in some way or another? What's the other industries that you would call yourselves in? What other verticals? If you're not a media company. Education, okay, cool. We can show that as well. All right, does anyone want to be a guinea pig? I'm gonna show an app. <laughs> no one wants to be a guinea pig. You wanna be, all right, awesome. You're gonna be the guinea pig, okay. So <laughs> here's what it does. <clears throat> because we didn't like doing it on paper anymore, Bravely, <laughs> bravely is going to put his own organization up against the industry. And then you'll be able to see how he's compared to other people who filled this out. And we've also uh, surveyed, uh, we've surveyed many media companies to, to see how they perform. So if you want, while Peter is p telling me his scores, oh, you could either hand it to me and then I could fill it in. Uh, you could fill out your own and then you can confidentially see how you compare to other media companies. And I can also bring up education for you. We have that as a vertical. Uh, so if you'd like to, to fill yourself to fill your, your thing in, and then at the end we'll see how you compare to, uh, to your, to your uh, industry peers based on many uh, levels of research. Okay, so Peter's mostly three and four here, so I'm gonna fill out for each category. Uh, I'm just going through the app and I'm gonna fill it out. Alignment, so he's got a three. Information, okay, next. We have each dimension on a separate page so that people can read through if they don't have the paper version. Three there. You're looking pretty good, Peter. I think you're gonna. I think you're gonna outrank a lot of other uh, companies here. All right, reuse two. Findability two. If anybody wants extra copies of this to bring uh, home or back to your office, you're welcome to them. System. There's three on the back. <laughs> Sorry, the process the process ones are on the back. So, <laughs> three on the back for process. It was too big to fit on one sheet, so we had to do it two sided. So we've been collecting this data now for about uh, a year or so, and uh, since we debuted the app. Uh, what we do is we let people go on, um, even if they're not our customer, and fill it out, and then they can see their self-assessment, but you don't get to see the comparative assessment unless you're a subscriber um, or a customer of ours, and then you can compare yourself. Uh, and then, of course, if, if you uh, are not in too great of a situation, if you're a customer of ours, you get to talk to us and we give you advice. Governance and integration. Okay, so I've filled out Peter here. Results. <laughs> Okay, so, all right, so Peter gets a 53. We call it real score because we're a real story group. So Peter gets a 53, that's, uh, that's not bad, <laughs> not bad. So this is out of the total score that you can get. Um, in people, he's got nine out of 15, information 14 out of 25, systems 10 out of 20, and uh, process seven out of 15. So. There's some visuals here where you can, you know, compare yourself. Um, 
it, it defaults to uh, comparing tech, the technology industry. So I'm just going to bring up, um, actually, I have it set to CPG retail because I use this with our customers on the fly um, when I'm talking to them and things like that. But you said you were in med basically media publishing, OK? And I'll hit submit. So this is going to now switch over, and it's going to compare, uh, compare you to media publishing. OK. So you have, a, for instance, in uh, a total, right, your, your raw score here out of the total that you can get here is, is 40. This normalizes it. This is out of 100, so it's a 53%. So we do that there. Um, so you're, you're just slightly behind uh, the, the media benchmark. And one of the challenges we have with this research and this study is that we let people assess themselves. And then we have some cases where it's our analyst team that's assessing the company. <laughs> so sometimes when people are assessing themselves, they, it depends on their personality, right? They're, they're either hard on themselves or they think they're better than they really are. So um, we have mish to match that data here. Um, we're thinking about potentially separating it out. We're thinking about, OK, do you want to compare yourself against other self-assessments or against industry expert assessments? Um, but you can see this is a combination of the two. So it's, in some cases, it's an assessment that myself or somebody on the team might have done versus uh, people filling in their own, their own uh, data. And this is a cross-industry average. One of the interesting things about um, a media company is that, uh, and we find this across all the technologies where we're doing this measurement, uh, media companies are very far ahead than, than many others uh, when it comes to not just, not just digital and media asset management technology, but also web content management, web streaming, uh, integration with back-end technologies. It's just something that they've been doing longer than a lot of the other industries that we've, that we've worked with. So then it breaks down as well by dimension. So uh, you know, it looks like here you've got um, you know, your, your technical expertise is, is lagging behind what you know, the industry benchmark is. So it's, it's, it seems that other media companies have slightly more technical expertise than you have. And then we go through each dimension and we um, measure that up for you. And the intention here, and this is what we find, is that it's a great conversation stimulator, right? As soon as you realize, uh, oh, we're in a situation where it looks like um, our, our expertise rating is really low. Maybe we need to describe what kind of expertise we need to bring in to be better at what we're doing. Um, our reuse is really low. Our findability isn't as good. Um, then we're in a situation where maybe we need a corporate taxonomist, or we need to rethink, of our, we need to rethink our metadata strategy. Um, we're finding that people are using this model as well to justify uh, a purchase, justify investment in a, in a certain uh, team member. I recently did a, uh, a description for a media librarian for one of our customers and because they, they said that their media archive, it's like the media goes to die and it goes into the archive and then we never find it again <laughs> because it's not properly categorized and tagged. And, and so they wanted to justify uh, hiring a librarian. So we use this to show, oh, reuse is low, findability is low, all the things that a librarian would be doing, right? They were, they were comparatively below their own industry benchmark as well as uh, the, even the cross-industry benchmark. And she was able to basically take that to her boss and say, look, you know, here's how we compare, and this is how we are against others in our industry. We really need to step it up here. And the nice thing is we've had, uh, because we an anonymize, we make everything anonymous, <laughs> you know, people have been willing to fill it out and, and, and know that it's not, their, it's not their personal data that's going to be shared, but it's, it's just a general um, you know, industry insights that you get. So great conversation starter and uh, also allows you to, if you need to, go to your boss and kind of use this as a, as a justification tool um, and that we like. So let's look at it against the education market. I think we have that in here um, since we have somebody here from education. There we go, education and research. So you can see um, the, media, the media benchmark is always the highest, it seems. Um, so what you've got here, see this is compared to the education market, um, Peter here is measuring up very well, right? Um, this is showing that compared to media, the edu education is not as, as advanced when it comes to uh, maturity in media asset management. Um, so that's just a little fact <laughs> that you can See here, same thing. Um, I remember as we collected this data, it was very interesting because uh, we really, it, it, I would say it validated a lot of our own experiences um, as analysts, as, as we did the research, where as, as, we, as we get more and more data, it's continuing to validate, oh, there's certain industries that are really quite behind 
um, nonprofit sector that doesn't have enough money to invest necessarily in streaming technologies, um, you know, we, we, we started to validate our own experiences. So. The most common denominator as far as what the biggest problem is? Yeah. Yeah, um, I think specifically to streaming media, right? So this is a general, I think it's important to remember, this is generalized for digital and media asset management. So some of the data that's going in here is from brand managers who are just managing images uh, or creative assets. So it's not just for video. Um, but I would say that the, the, the biggest common denominator in terms of, of problems is, is not actually the technology. <laughs> it's very rarely the technology. Uh, people sometimes have the wrong tool, um, but that doesn't cause as many problems as not having the proper staffing in place, uh, as not having uh, executive support at the top to make sure that there's, there's um, socialization of you know, adoption going on and that there's support for the team that's actually doing the work. Um, and especially metadata constantly comes back as an issue. So metadata is a big driver for the reuse and the findability. So if I go to the information dimension, generally what we find as a, as a corollary is that if the information ratings are very low, it brings everything else down, right? So if you don't have good metadata, you're losing on reuse, you're losing on findability. If you don't actually define the use cases, so as I was talking about earlier, um, you know, understanding what are you actually trying to accomplish, what are your benchmarks, what are you trying to do better. Uh, if you don't have that straight, then the other stuff doesn't fall into place. Um, so those are, those are the biggies. Um, it's pretty rare that somebody says, uh, for example, my security is really awful, <laughs> right? Because usually there's, there's standards in an organization where they don't even let you buy the technology or implement the technology if it doesn't have the, you know, the proper security standards. Um, Infrastructure is less and less of an issue, especially now with big cloud providers and people moving to uh, cloud streaming, cloud hosting. You're, you're usually not doing it yourself, um, or you're usually leveraging uh, you know, broader services for that. So that tends to be less of an issue than all the stuff in the information dimension and all the stuff in the people dimension. Yeah, OK, OK. I think off the top of my head, I, I'm not super sure which, uh, but it looks like, I mean, it looks specifically like this is only a five. You know, so in the education sector, the, the staffing and the lack of staffing is obviously a huge problem. And I think that speaks to the education nonprofit is often just thinly staffed. And so they don't have, you know, enough, enough people and expertise there. Um, whereas they're not as much lower in other, you know, in other areas. Okay, so I'm going to just switch back to my <laughs> slides. Hopefully that, that makes sense and kind of what we're, what we're trying to do as a firm. Hopefully that's, that's useful and interesting and helpful to you. And I hope you'll, I hope you'll take those sheets back. Uh, you know, Scott's got more of those sheets. So if you want to take them back, and you know, it's a great collaborative uh, session. You know, I facilitate a lot of these sessions with our uh, customers. And now I'm glad that I can do it with an app rather than a piece of paper. Um, so we, we invite you to use our app uh, as well. And of course, if you become a customer, you get a whole bunch of data along with it. Um, and that was the app that I was just showing you. So I just want to give you, um, um, just sort of to, to, to close up, a few um, examples of what, uh, what this sometimes turns into when it comes to the score. So your question about the education sector and where specifically they were, they were sort of falling short. So as we started to collect this data, we'd get a lot of similar scores. So let's say we're going to do a tale of two real score assessments, <laughs> right? You have two customers from the same industry, and both scored 36 out of 60. So this placed them in the top quartile for their particular effectiveness measurement. Okay? So the question is, is the transformation roadmap the same for both of these companies, just because they both had the same score? Right? And the answer is no, <laughs> because they had completely different problems. Here's company A versus company B. So uh, overall, as I mentioned, same score. Enterprise A uh, was OK in organizational development, but didn't select the right tools. Okay. So they had a good uh, people score, good business capabilities, but not good systems in place. So they were a candidate where after they did the assessment, they said, you know what, we really need to replace some of our technology. Let's figure out you know, what technology we need to replace. Versus customer B, 
they actually had the right technology in place, uh, but they were lacking certain expertise to improve, uh, and they had certain business capabilities that were, that were missing. So it was actually a completely different sort of strategy to move forward, and it was also completely different benchmarks that they chose to establish right, at the beginning of the project. They said, okay, we're going to benchmark ourselves. We're going to do standards for people and process, and you know, a few for systems, because there's still room for improvement. Uh, but it was, again, totally different from the, different from the other organizations. So it's not just about your score. As I mentioned, you need to figure out what are your specific benchmarks and where specifically do you need to improve. And what we've also found um, that often you know, business and IT, or more broadly sort of the different stakeholder groups, they have very different perceptions of their current state. So another thing that's happened is we've had, say, 10 people from the same company go in and fill in the model. And then all of a sudden they realize, wow, we have completely different impressions of where we are, right? And that's, that's often what holds back effectiveness and often what holds back progress is just the different perceptions. Some people think it's a good tool because maybe that's the, the technical guy who knows what he's doing with the tool, but maybe the, the business users who aren't as skilled who just want to get that one little clip, oh my gosh, they get all these results and they don't know where to go to get that specific clip of the video, uh, they, have a, they have a different you know, perception. They think the usability of the tool sucks. <laughs> yeah. What does that mean, lack of executive buy-in? Yeah, so um, it, it's a situation where um, you don't have somebody at the top that is advocating for the project. So a project might be, uh, we've adopted a new video streaming tool. Uh, we need to train people in it. We need to uh, get the budget for it, and it's, you know, really important that we have the budget to integrate it with our production tools, as an example. If you don't have an executive that's advocating for that, signing the checks, um, making sure that it's a priority, that can become a problem because then people don't understand what the project's for, they don't necessarily pay attention to the changes, they're not becoming part of the change management process, that sort of stuff. Yeah. A lot of people see that as a problem um, when it comes to needing a new technology that they need money for to buy. Uh, if they don't have an executive that understands. I got this question last week. Someone just said to me, how do, I, how do I get money for my video management solution when the people at the top have no idea that it's important? <laughs> this, this conference, you've got, you know, it's all about video, so it's sort of a different audience here. But last week, I was at a more general um, sort of marketing conference, and, and they need a video management solution, but the, you know, the people at the top didn't, didn't think they did. <laughs> so without having that, that buy-in, it was difficult for them to get done what they needed to get done. So different, different challenges uh, depending on you know, the type of organization that you're in. Uh, here's two different sorts of uh, ways that, that people use these assessments. So this is a major hotel chain who was a, a customer of ours versus a, a manufacturing company. So the hotel chain, they, uh, they took marketing and IT and, and did, each of them did their own assessment. Uh, and then they identified the differences in, in perception uh, versus you know, both among the teams and the technologies. And then they prioritized their future focus areas uh, to ensure that the departments were actually on the same page. Right? So that's really important. Uh, the manufacturing company, same thing, um, but they, they did it as a group. So they all got together and kind of had a workshop and did the assessment. Uh, and then they got alignment on what their current state was. And then they did short, medium, and uh, long-term targets. So you can use the model to, to set those targets, but you know, it's just meant to be a guidepost. Like If you have completely different targets based on whatever your corporate goals are, or you've got to make your boss happy so you can get your raise, you know, whatever it might be, the important thing is just to identify those and, and understand what you need to do to get there. So we say there's just a few uh, gaps as well when it comes to, uh, when it comes to, to these assessments, right? First, just don't, don't think the, these are just my last few thoughts. Um, don't think that the software is, is the solution. Um, but if you do score very low on the system scale, meaning you discover that your systems are not particularly effective or appropriate for what you need to do, um, I always say there's, there's two gaps that exist, right? There's what you have the capacity to do, and then there's maybe what your technology has the capacity to do. And I call that the capacity gap, right? There's what you're capable of, and then there's, the software that you can, you can learn about and you can use to its fullest extent. Um, but then I always say there's the hyperbole gap. So there's what the sales guy <laughs> says the software can do, 
Uh, and I always say you have to identify what the hyperbole gap is because oftentimes people set their benchmarks based on hyperbole of a salesperson who wasn't really telling you the whole truth. So as you think about measuring your effectiveness, as you think about establishing your benchmarks, as you think about where you want to be two, three, four years down the line, um, do it based on what the real capabilities of your organization are and your software is and your, your, your information is, not based on hyperbole. Don't believe the hype. <laughs> so uh, what happens if you, if you go the hyperbole route and you establish things that or establish benchmarks or goals that aren't, aren't realistic? Uh, you end up with low customer satisfaction. When I say customers, I mean both your internal and your viewers externally. Uh, and you often end up buying tools that aren't the right ones, right? So figure out what your real capacity is. Set your goals based on the real capacity and don't, don't overreach. That's my point here. And then my last slide uh, is around fitting it into the bigger picture. So, um, you know, even though this is, this is a streaming media conference, uh, we advise on such a large breadth of technologies. Uh, we've got, you know, the, the, the sort of typical streaming media technologies that everyone talks about here, you know, media asset management, uh, CDNs, OVPs on there as well. Um, but I always say in order to really be effective, you need to put it into a much bigger enterprise technology picture. And this is a reference model that oftentimes I, I'm putting it in front of a, a group of people that just work in one of these boxes, right? So maybe you just work in the MAM box, maybe you work in the OVP box, maybe you work in, in you know, the, the mobile media distribution box, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, I think that you as, as, as people who work in media, you can become more effective if you understand how you fit into this bigger enterprise picture today. Uh, and this is a big factor in, in success and effectiveness. Um, is knowing what fits into each of these boxes, how can you know, the media that you're creating contribute to the, the bigger mission of content distribution and, and, and marketing and whatever it is your organization does, education, whatever it might be, um, and, and fit it into what is really a, a, a big puzzle pieces of, of, um, of ways of creating, of ways of reusing, of ways of distri distributing. Um, so I invite you, I'm happy to send you this, this slide and and, and, and figure out what those arrows really do, right? So there's a lot of arrows on these slides where there's lots of different data that's passing into different systems that's being used. Uh, so if you are streaming video on your website, for example, you know, how does it get converted to the right format, right? How does, it, how does it get personalized if it gets personalized? How does the advertising get mashed up with it? All those sorts of factors to really define what these arrows do very specifically so you know how your work fits into a bigger picture. That's effectiveness for your whole organization. And with four minutes left, that's my last slide. I'm happy to take a few questions. Um, and as I mentioned, we're happy to give you more of these to take home uh, to your home offices and, and work with your colleagues on. Um, and if you have interest in the app and the data, um, my colleague Scott's back there to talk about it. Questions? Yes? Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think uh, the trick with this is it's, it's, more, it's still more art than science. <laughs> I think um, in terms of establishing your own benchmarks, you mean, or benchmarking yourself against, against others. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Ah, uh, with your with your customers. Yeah, that's not something that we <laughs> that we're doing here. Uh, I think that you know measuring customer satisfaction um, in relation to this would be an interesting study. Um, it's not something we've we've necessarily ever done. Uh, I think the use of surveys today and, and a lot of the information that we gather in our research is through surveys with certain sorts of organizations. Um, we always gather vertical, we always, but uh, you could correlate the two. It would be interesting. You say, okay, we, we've worked on findability work. To, yeah. I think you would. I think you would in terms of measuring customer satisfaction and then and how, your, how your effectiveness goes up in this model. I think it would be very interesting to do that. Um, it's not something that I thought about, <laughs> but I think it could be, it, it should, if you're doing, um, assuming that your processes, 
and your information model and the elements of good media management are carried out with the intent of your customer in mind, it should improve customer satisfaction. Uh, but it's really internal. Yeah, it's not about, it's, it's, it, it's about your internal operations, about your internal technology systems, and you know, whether you're able to produce faster, distribute faster, get things out, be more effective. It's not about, it's not, definitely not a customer satisfaction model. But I would think, and I would hope, that the better you get at this, you're also better at delivering to your customer what they want. Should be, anyway. Any other questions? It does. Um, I, I think it depends on the use case. <laughs> Again, I, I always come back to use cases uh, and, and sort of figure out what's the end goal and work backwards. Um, uh, you know, having, having been involved in a lot of sort of metadata design projects over the years, um, uh, you have to consider those, those different departments, but it's all about the alignment and figuring out what's the commonality. Um, and if, if they have two names for the same thing, um, that's what to SARI or for, and you know, there's ways to manage that from a data perspective. So that if somebody searches for one term and somebody searches for another, you're going to be able to get, you know, the same thing. Uh, so it's really an alignment, you know, it's really an alignment exercise for a good taxonomist to do. So if you have someone who is centrally managing the librarian, yeah, who is then interfacing with multiple departments uh -huh. on their individual processes, that's the thing for them to manage. Absolutely, yeah. So. Um, and they should also be looking at search logs, right? So it's not just a matter of working with the people and finding, oh, okay, we need new terms in our controlled vocabulary. It's also what are people searching for in the system? Um, and in some cases, those librarians will look at the consumer side of it as well. So if you've got a VOD platform and consumers are searching for certain stuff, uh, that librarian would be monitoring that and then incorporating that in the tagging uh, as early as possible because then you're, you're enriching, you know, enriching through the curation process over time. So, okay, I think I'm out of time. I think I'm over time. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, if you have any other questions, let me know. I think my email is not on there. Um, but you can find me pretty easily, Teresa Regley, uh, on Twitter, or just get a card from Scott, and you can funnel questions through him if you got it. Thanks. Say again? Yeah, if you need a copy of the slides, just email me as well or email Scott, and I'm happy to send them along. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. <laughs>